Sean Mize here, and today I'm going to be teaching on the psychology of writing emails that build trust. And before I get into the psychology that goes into writing these emails, I'd like to share with you why I believe that an understanding of the psychology that builds trust and why understanding what that psychology is, is critical to writing both emails and email campaigns that build trust. And I'd also like to share with you why I believe that it's important to build trust in email campaigns. And perhaps the best place to start is a contrast. We'll start with what I don't believe that we should do. However, I believe I see this a lot, and that is there's several things. Number one, we see a lot of emails that are being written. I have personally written emails like this before, and my guess is that you've written emails like this before. And those emails are standalone emails that have some purpose other than building trust. For example, attempting to sell someone something, attempting some, attempting to persuade someone to believe something, et cetera, et cetera. So we tend to, I've done it before, you probably do it. Uh, but we, I believe we see these emails on a regular basis, emails that kind of stand alone and have some type of a purpose, for example, selling or uh, simply persuasion. And what happens in my belief is that when we write and when we use emails like this, two things occur. Number one, the obvious, we're, we, we appear to be just like everybody else. So when we write those types of emails, we are not, uh, we are not distinguished at all. We have no unique differentiation between us and anybody else out there. And I'll tell you, if you're in a niche that is competitive, then there's, there's two things that I like to think about competitive niches. Number one, I love competitive niches because of the fact that there's plenty of demand. However, if you're in a competitive niche, if you want to sell a lot or you want to sell more than, than other people or other companies that are in your niche, you must differentiate yourself in such a way that other people are willing to pay a premium for working with you rather than working with other people. And... So, therefore, I believe that in our email campaign and in the emails that, that make up our email campaign, that our primary purpose in that email campaign should be to build trust and build relationships and allow the sales and the coaching programs or coaching interactions that occur to simply be a result of the relationships that occur rather than necessarily overt selling. And I don't believe that I see a lot of that. I don't believe I see much of that in most Internet marketing email campaigns. I don't, as much as, I'll be honest with you, my first year or so writing emails, although some people would look at those emails and say, hey, you know, these are friendlier emails or they build a little bit more, little bit more trust than perhaps some of my competition did. In, in my opinion, when I look at those, they, the purpose in those email campaigns, that those first email campaigns, was not to build trust and relationship. Instead, it was to make sales. And what in making that transition myself, I have discovered an incredible increase in, in the average level of trust and in the average level that – the average amount that people are willing to invest with me to work with me rather than working with someone else. Okay. I also do not believe that emails should exist in a vacuum. Meaning that, with, with exception, with, with possible exception, so let's just assume that you've created a relationship and you're building trust, and now you do have something you, you'd like to announce or something 
that you'd like to give people that are extra that maybe doesn't doesn't fit into an overall scheme of relationship building and trust as long as it doesn't degrade that I think that there's an occasionally a place for that however I believe that the bulk of the emails that go into our email campaign should fit together in such a way that those emails work together and build trust now one of the things that's led me to the to believing the way that I'm sharing with you right now is and let's go let let me go back to an idea that says of what we do not want it to look like it is this idea that that email campaigns emails and email marketing sometimes I believe that we think of it as being something that we have to master because it's a unique skill I believe instead that email marketing should simply be a continuation of the communication the communication style and the relationship and trust style that we exhibit in the rest of our life and communication I don't believe that our email campaign should be something that has some special characteristics that vary necessarily from the characteristics that we use in our everyday life and so just to kind of create an example let's assume that we meet someone new this can be a possible business associate this could be a new friend this could be a a new romantic relationship it could be any any person that we meet that there is the, the possibility of developing into more than it is right now so developing into some type of a relationship or possibly a friendship or a business relationship over time and what we would find that would happen whether we make an effort to do this or we don't and it comes to us naturally what we will find is that that relationship over a period of time will go through a number of psychological stages okay, and without naming what those stages are without breaking it down we just look at a six month period of time and we say that you know perhaps initially the first contact past meeting someone might be you know coffee 30 minutes coffee this is an introductory session we're just barely getting to know each other whether it's personal or business at this point there's a filtering that's going on the person that we're meeting with filtering us we're filtering them and we're we're asking ourselves do, do we do we like this person do we want any more out of this do we want to meet again and if either one of those people makes a decision no I don't like this person no I don't want to meet again no I can't I can't offer anything to this person or this person can't offer anything to me then the if just one person makes that decision then there, there should be no future meeting if however there is a future meeting the next meeting might have more intent to it whether it's another coffee shop meeting or whether it's a meeting over lunch perhaps okay now if we move this if we continue to move this down over time say six months we may find that whether it's a business or a personal relationship we may spend more and more time with this individual our conversation will become deeper with this individual so we've got two issues we the time will probably be spending more time with this individual the time that we spend with that person will be more more uh, meaningful and it will be accompanied by two things deeper communication and also a deeper knowledge of each other you know whether this is a business development or this is a personal development whether it is a a, uh, a platonic friendship or it's a romantic relationship in all of those cases in order for that relationship in almost all cases in order for this for that particular relationship no matter what kind of relationship it is in order for it to become solid over time it must grow slowly and it must grow incrementally it must grow deeper the communication must grow deeper and the knowledge must also grow deeper and now if at any point we attempt to rush from where we're at now to six months from now 
whether it's a business relationship or it's a friendship. We try to rush to the six-month depth, okay, on our first meeting or our second meeting. Then we scare the other individual off, okay, whether it's a romantic relationship, whether it's a new friend, a, a platonic relationship, someone that we met at church, someone that our family is getting to know, or a business relationship where we're hoping to make some kind of a sale six months down the road. If we, if we attempt to deepen the relationship on that first or second meeting to the place where it should have taken three to six months perhaps to get to, then in almost every single case, we are going to completely destroy that relationship. Okay, now, I believe that when people read and develop a relationship with you via email, I believe that the best way for us to develop a relationship via email is to as closely as possible imitate or mimic the psychology that goes into building a relationship offline, including everything that I have just discussed and including everything, all of the psychology that may go into a, a business or a friendship relationship that occurs, especially the idea of time, of a deepening of the communication over time, and the depth of knowledge about that individual. I believe that when we, when we use that pattern in our email campaign, we are able to bond with the person at a deeper level than just someone reading an email or reading a sales page or reading a website. But instead, we are bonding with the actual person. And then what happens is, just like when we bond offline, whether it's a friend or a business relationship, then once the relationship has deepened to a certain point, then in that relationship it becomes natural, if it's a business relationship, for us to invest or become invested in. If it's a friendship, then the relationship continues to develop so that there's perhaps more and more commitment that occurs in that particular relationship, okay, whether it's an, an all-encompassing commitment or it is small commitments that occur over time, those commitments are able and those investments in each other are able to occur naturally as a result of the trust and the depth of the relationship that has occurred. However, in, just as in the offline world, if in email – we attempt to divulge too much information about ourselves, if we attempt to find out too much information about the other individual, if we attempt to deepen the communication level too soon, if we attempt to overwhelm the other individual with too much information, we simply threaten the viability of that relationship. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Oh, I'd like to do this. Let me open this up for any questions. I'm going to go next into my journey. How how I've how I've developed the use of psychology in the emails. So so far I've I've just given you what my belief is on developing that relationship via email and I believe that it should it should exactly work the exact same way that we would have and build and develop an offline relationship. So any questions or comments on anything that I've just shared? Okay. I just want to say it's totally right on. I, I'm even thinking of romantic relationships. I'm thinking of a situation I ran into recently where actually um, – a there's an internet marketer that I really like, actually, and they put me through a program trying to get me to do coaching, and I was I was very upset by the questions they were asking of how much I made and did I own my house or rent and you know really private things that it was like what do you you know this is not none of your business, so I was just thinking about all this and and of course I didn't invest any money with that, and I've lost a lot of trust in that same guy just because of that. 
Absolutely. And yet it probably wasn't the depth of the questions, but it was the fact that those questions existed at the wrong place in your relationship. If you had developed a deeper trust and relationship, then those, rela those questions could have fit into a deeper place of trust and relationship and been perfectly natural. So that's absolutely. Yes. Thanks for sharing that. That's a great example of, 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 of what, we, what I've just discussed. And it was a telemarketer. It wasn't the real guy. And the telemarketer was obviously reading his script. And <laughs> it wasn't even the same guy. And, like, for example, Sean, if you asked those questions, I would feel comfortable answering them. Because I knew, I know you would be doing it for the purpose of helping me analyze something. Whereas in their case, I was very upset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, folks, let's uh, let me go and give you my journey in terms of, of um, and, and let me say this, the, the journey in terms of the psychology that goes into each individual email is, I think, totally separate from what I have just shared with you. So what I've just shared with you is a concept that I've believed for for a long time and that I've used almost from the very beginning of, of my internet marketing journey in, in building relationships. And I'll share with you that, that one of the things that, that most of you know that I do differently in this particular segment of my marketing is I attempt to build the relationship almost 100% via email. So in this segment of my business, I don't have a uh, you know, huge website with plenty of content that people can you know, go to download tons of content on the very first day that they meet me. Instead, I allow them to receive pieces of that content over time. And I've done that very specifically not because I necessarily want to hold the information back, because over time I'm willing to give away an incredible amount of free information, and not because I necessarily want to, to hide anything from anybody in terms of not wanting them to learn it. However, I believe that by allowing an incredible download of information on that very first day or two, when perhaps the interest is the highest, that it Although it may satisfy curiosity, and although it may create an instant heating up of a little bit of trust and a little bit of an authority that happens in doing that, I believe that it sabotages the ability to mimic the offline uh, uh, mechanisms that we're, my guess is that we're born with or we learn very, very early on in our life that allows us to build relationships. And again, I'm fo I want to focus on building relationship and trust rather than just a huge download of information that perhaps build, builds, builds a level of, uh, of, of authority or perception of authority. So my, my personal journey has been when I, when I first began writing Internet emails, everything I've just shared with you, I believed, you know, certainly I, I couldn't have, um, given you the details in the way that I just have because of the depth of the understanding and it's grown over time. But my purpose in, in writing emails, even when I was at the same place that many people are in, in terms of simply writing standalone emails that attempt to do some per, per, purpose, whether it's a sale or persuasion of a belief, et cetera, et cetera. But my concept has been that I want, I've always wanted to write emails to real people. And one of the things that I believe has flavored my email writing is something that I learned, and I, I don't remember the exact source. I know that this is not something that I, just, I created. I, someone taught me this. And it's the idea that, that we want to write emails, if we can imagine ourselves writing emails to one particular person, and then you know making sure that that email is fit to send out to the entire list, rather than feeling as though we are writing emails to an anonymous list of 10,000 or 100,000 anonymous people. Instead, 
when I'm writing an email, I like to just believe in my mind that I'm writing it to a particular person. And I've, I've done this probably since the very, very beginning or very early on. And, and I believe that that has had, I mean, that, that, that's been one of the incredible, one of the pieces that has made my email writing, even before I understood everything I'm going to share with you today, has made it strong and allowed those relationships to build. And I'll, and I'll tell you that over time, one of the things that I get asked about a lot is how can I write emails that grab, that build trust and relationships like you do? And frankly, up until probably the last six to nine months, I haven't been able to give a good answer for that because deep down inside, I haven't really known more than what I just shared with you and in terms of envisioning that I'm writing to a specific person. And sure, sometimes, and obviously because of some of the background, some of the sales background that I have, you know, occasionally a, a, a word or a phrase might float in that, that, that some would say might has, have a, a, some type of persuasive ability to it. And so there's a little bit of that that's kind of thrown in there. And so when people have asked me those questions, not knowing the, not, not knowing the psychology or totally understanding the psychology behind it, I've attempted to create formulas. And, and, you know, if you've studied much of what I do, you've probably seen some of those formulas. I create a formula for this type of an email that does this, and it's this type of a f email that does this, and this type of an email that does that. And I believe there's a place for those formulas, but I believe that what I'm going to give you now will allow you to go so deep into the psychology of it that when you begin to write emails using the psychology I give you today, that you'll be able to write emails either A, totally from scratch without using any formula, or you'll be able to create your own formulas that totally fit into your personality rather than necessarily having to adapt a formula that I use or that someone else uses that although it works from a psychological standpoint, it doesn't exactly fit in with who you are or the psychology of you as a person. And so... One of the things, just kind of going into my journey, one of the things that that obviously because of my background that I've studied over the years is, is you know, basic sales techniques, and, and I believe that, that that has helped in some of the email writing. It, I believe it certainly helped in the development of sales letter writings. But at some, some time ago, maybe a year, a year and a half ago, I – I revisited the work of Robert Cialdini, uh, and of course he's written a number of books on uh, on persuasion. I, I believe that he's considered to be the father of, of modern persuasion in terms of running some of the very initial studies on persuasion. And when when I initially studied this material, and I'll, I'll just what he, what he did in that particular work was he went through and he codified about six, maybe seven specific behaviors that he believes are, are uh, create a persuasive environment. And in that particular book, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, again, he's written a number of other books and and by the way, I do recommend that if you haven't read this book or if you haven't read it recently and studied it in light of the work that you're doing online, whether it's email writing or whether it's sales letter writing or whatever it may be that you're doing online, I suggest taking another look at it. But what he does is he goes into each one of these persuasion tactics and dissects why they work and gives examples of perhaps how you could use them in your marketing, okay? And I'll go ahead and give them to you. And just, This is just a list. I'm not going to go into details on how each one of these works. My guess is that most of you will be able to identify with most of these. You know, if, if you don't know them inside out, get his book, and, and he'll teach it all to you. Reciprocity, commitment and consistency, social proof, authority, liking, and scarcity. And obviously the premise in using these is that as we use these 
in our communication, whether it's it's offline, whether it's one on one, whether it's in in uh, speaking scenarios, whether it's with friends, whether it's with business associates, whether it's email, whether it's sales letters, whatever it is, that when we use one or more of these particular tactics, that we are able to position ourselves to be more persuasive. Okay, and. At the time that I that I studied this material in earnest, my question was, okay, how can I add in social proof or how can I add in authority? How can I throw in some reciprocity to my campaign? Okay, and, and sure enough, as I did that, my email campaigns uh and this is very subjective, okay, because you know, there's a number of different ways where I where I, I measure the impact of my campaigns, and sometimes it's not always um, measured in the number of opens or necessarily the number of purchases because at the same time as I'm implementing these things, my training programs have advanced, my price points have advanced, other skill sets have advanced. Okay, so the improvement on on uh, conversion rates and dollars per subscriber and that kind of type of thing um, probably cannot all be um, attributed to this. However, I believe that a portion of it has. Okay, and so what I did was Hello. I went in and said, yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, that I, I've added in a specific trait or a specific tactic, reciprocity or a social proof or an authority element or a scarcity element, that that email campaign over time has developed and grown. And, and, and let me say this, at the same time that in growing and learning my business, sales letter writing, relationship building, and email build, in doing that and in email campaign creation, I've studied a number of other sources and obviously added in other things to all of those places in addition to what I'm sharing with you now. However, the next incredible for me was, and I'll just, I'll give you the author in the book first and I'll explain everything that's in it, well, everything that's in it, but the concept. Uh, that's Russell Granger, and this is The Seven Triggers to Yes, the new science behind influencing people's decisions. Okay, now I have to say this, and I have absolutely no idea if, if Granger wrote this uh, in a vacuum, totally um, um, absent anything that he may have learned from Cialdini, or if, if what he learned about persuasion from Cialdini, just like many, many people who study persuasion, in, obviously includes Cialdini's work and his understanding. What, what Granger does... In, in the seven triggers to yes, the new science behind influencing people's decisions, he does two things that, in my opinion, builds on, doesn't necessarily improve, but builds on and increases the understanding of the use of the tactics of persuasion that Cialdini teaches in influence the psychology of persuasion. He does two things. Number one, he goes deeper psychologically in this book than I believe that Cialdini does in going even deeper than just the studies, but explaining why those particular things are activated in our minds. Now, what I'm telling you, the last sentence is very subjective. Some could read uh, Cialdini's book and, and believe that he does exactly what I just shared with you. So what I'm telling you is very subjective. I simply personally believe that Granger goes a little bit deeper into the psychological side of things, the science behind it, rather than just the results of experiments, social experiments. Okay, the second thing that he does is, in my mind, and, and again, whenever we read any information or we study information like what you're listening to me right now, obviously part of our understanding of it is flavored by our personal experience, what we already know, and also how we can implement it in our own business or our life. And for me, the second huge thing that I learned from Granger was the idea that not only could we use these 
specific tactics and add a tactic here and add a tactic there to increase the efficiency or the impact of our campaigns, but that we could create an entire campaign based around the concept of using as many of these tactics as possible and combining them in such a way that instead of simply adding some trust, we create trust by using this combination. Okay, now, what Granger does is he gives us a list of what he calls triggers. So instead of positioning them as perhaps tactics or strategies that we can use for persuasion, Granger names these triggers. There's a lot of overlap between there's a lot of overlap between these characteristics. I'll give them to you. Uh, one is the friendship trigger. The next is the authority trigger. The next is the consistency trigger. The next is the reciprocity trigger. The next is the reason why trigger. And the final is the hope trigger. Okay, now, Obviously, if we compare these lists side by side, we can come up with very, very close matches. However, I believe that there's two significant differences in the understanding of the material in Granger's book and in Granger's teaching. Okay? One is the reason why trigger is standalone, whereas in Cialdini's work, uh, and I don't remember which tactic it's associated with, he studies it and he teaches it, but it doesn't stand alone as a trigger, and the hope trigger is additional. Okay, now, what Granger teaches, and again, I recommend purchasing and studying both of these books. The, what, what Granger posits is that we can create relationship and trust by specifically choosing combinations of these triggers and using them in our campaigns. Okay? As a result of learning this material, I now, when I design, when I design my programs, when I design an email campaign, when I design an entire sales campaign, which may include email, it may include sales letters, it may include one-on-one -on -one conversations, it may include group conversations, teleseminars, well, webinars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It may even include the actual products, books, CDs, uh, DVDs, MP3s, uh, web, uh, video files. When, when that sales campaign is created, the very first thing that I think about is how can I incorporate the most number of these triggers and tactics obviously tastefully, how can I include these in the campaign and include them in balance? Okay, so instead of writing all of the emails in such a way or all of the materials so that they really focus on my authority or so that they're all based on reciprocity, give, 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 or that they're all based on reason why, instead there is an effort to use all of them. So some of the reciprocity trigger is activated by giving away some free content. Hope is triggered by helping people imagine, imagine or visualize what their future could be like with my solution. The reason why trigger is something that, that I tend to use a lot. You know, I mean, even if we look at the teaching I'm doing today, hey, what's the reason I'm teaching this? What's the reason I use this material? What's the reason it's important for you when I'm building a relationship? What's the reason why you should listen to me? What's the reason why you should use this free content? What's the reason why you should consider purchasing one of my solutions? What's the reason why you should work with me in a coaching environment? Okay? Same thing with consistency and friendship and social proof and liking and scarcity. Okay? So that we use all of those in some type of a balance, and we build those into our campaign. Okay, let's take this. Let's open the call up. Any questions or comments on anything that I have taught with you here so far? Uh, Sean, it's Dave. I got on a little bit late here, and you were talking in reference to a book. Uh, what was the author's name? Uh, the first book is Robert Cialdini, and that's Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. And uh, that's, that's really a seminal work on persuasion. 
and I, I, I would call it a classic, been around for, for quite some time. The second book is Russell Granger. This is a relatively new book, The Seven Triggers to Yes, The New Science Behind Influencing People's Decisions. Great. Thank you. You're welcome, Dave. Good to have you here. Any other questions or comments, folks, before I move on? Okay. So moving on, next step in, and, and obviously that, what I'm teaching you today is the psychology of writing the emails that that build that trust. And I, I believe that so far I've given you, obviously, not all of the psychology that I use. However, if you were to, to take, do an in-depth study of both of the books that I've just given you, you will, you will have an incredible amount of that psychology. You can use the framework that I have just given you to be able to create email campaigns for which this works. Okay, so let's assume that you have all of the background that I've just given you. Let's also assume that you were to study both of these books and you were to learn all of the psychology that goes into persuasion and building relationships. And by the way, I, don't, I believe that persuasion for persuasion's sake is totally useless. I believe that persuasion for some other purpose can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Okay, so having the tool of persuasion to be able to help someone save their life is an incredible tool. To be able to use the tool, to be able to use, use a skill of persuasion to help somebody grow closer to you in a business relationship or to use persuasion to have someone grow closer to you in a legitimate friendship, okay? That's where persuasion can be highly powerful. I believe that persuasion can be used to build trust and build relationship in email campaigns and business relationships and friendships in entire sales campaigns. However, the tactics themselves, when they stand alone, I, I believe that for the most part they're, they're pretty they're, they're pretty useless. I mean, any one persuasion tactic or trigger can be used to help move us closer, but we're always moving closer to something. And so the tactic, in my mind, in and of itself, just standing alone, has very little, if any, value. However, when it is used for the good, helping someone move from here to there, from where they're at to where, they are, where, where they'd like to be, helping move yourself from where you are to where you'd like to be, then I believe that those persuasion tactics and triggers can be highly powerful, and then that power is multiplied exponentially, multiplied literally exponentially when you use several or all of these tactics or triggers together. Okay, so if you take everything that I've taught you today, you were to study both of these books, learn not just what the triggers and tactics are, but exactly why they work and how to use them, okay, and then next, when you sit down to write your email campaign, if you draw out a timeline, so let's just say that our timeline is that we want to write a 15-day email campaign, and we'll use that for an example right here. However, I believe, and i tell you what, I'll even give you another example of a one-year campaign. That would obviously be a much more general example here. The, the idea when we are building relationships is that we are going to build them so that they will grow over the course of time. If we're building relationship and trust, we're going to build very little relationship and trust in the first 15 days, and hence our total percentage of sales is going to be very low in the first 15 days. But if we continue to build that relationship and trust over time, then our sales will continue to grow, our relationship and trust will continue to grow. And so I believe that email campaigns, sales campaigns, should last at least six months to 12 months. In fact, in some of my own marketing, you know, I find that sometimes people spend time building relationship with me without ever making a purchase for as much as two years. That's three years before the trust and the need in their life is equal to the investment that I ask and what I am able to help them with. And in, and in my case, if I were to have only a six-month or a 12-month campaign, just like many of you, if you cut your campaigns off at too soon. And again, I don't know exactly what that number is, but I believe that six months or 12 months is too soon. 
because people do buy from me after two to three years on a campaign, I believe that a campaign should be structured in such a way, should be able to work in such a way that people can continue to build relationships until the trust is there, that the trust is at a high enough level and their need is at a high enough level to take action with you. Okay, so let's just say, for example, I'm going to create a 15-day campaign. My purpose in this 15-day campaign is I'm going to call it twofold only because I'm calling it a 15-day campaign. I don't believe that this 15-day campaign should exist in a vacuum. I believe it should simply be the first 15 days of a, of a year campaign. Okay, but I'll give it to you so that it has a definite beginning and an end. Okay, so let's assume that we want to create a 15-day campaign that ends on the 15th to 17th or, say, between the 15th and 20th day with an opportunity for someone to explore working with you at a deeper level. Now, please understand that only even if you do everything perfectly correctly for those first 15 days, only a percentage of people are ready to work with you at that time. Only a percentage of people have built enough relationship and trust to work with you. And only a percentage of people have the actual need right now for whatever it is that you offer. Okay? Because some people may begin looking for answers for something a year before they have a need. So, you know, it kind of goes back, you know, if we were to use an offline example, perhaps someone's looking for a new home. They know they're not going to purchase the new home for, let's say, one year. However, because they want to have an idea of what's out there, what the price ranges are, you know, what the finishes are on homes, what part of town they might like to live in, they might start looking at homes 12 months earlier. But if, the, if, if they've already made the decision, they're not going to move for another year. The finances aren't going to be there for another year. There's something else that's holding them back from doing it for another year. If that real estate agent overly pressures this individual, rather than simply building a relationship and trust, that, relate, that real estate agent will probably lose the trust, and 12 months from now when it's time to purchase a house, that individual will not go with that real estate agent. However, if the real estate agent is wise enough to be able to determine, does this person want to buy a house two weeks from now, or do they want to buy a house from a year from now, and then cater their relationship and trust-building campaign to last 15 days or a year, or to make it flexible enough that after two weeks of looking at houses, the real estate agent can possibly ask, or in this case perhaps has asked earlier, you know, when are you looking to buy a home? Well, we're looking at buying one within the next month. Excellent. Okay, now we go into high gear and we, you know, start presenting some more options. It says, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at purchasing a home. I'd like to make these kinds of decisions between now and a year from now, but I'm not going to make that purchase. The real estate agent has to say, okay, it's okay that I'm not making the sale. I'm not closing the deal right now. Okay, but if I continue to build relationship and trust, and I can legitimately do that a year from now, it's the exact same thing on your email campaign. If 100 people join your email campaign, I'm going to throw some numbers out there. These are not necessarily scientifically accurate or anything like that. Let's say that 100 people join your opt-in email list. Let's just assume that 20% of them, the only thing, the only reason that they opted in was because they're just plain old curious about something that you had. Okay, these people will probably never, ever, ever purchase from you, and that's okay. You have another 20% who may not need your solution for two years, and your email campaign should be built in such a way that it will allow that to occur if that's what's necessary. Another 20% of your email campaign may not need your solution for six months, and your email campaign should be built in such a way that it accommodates that. Another 20% of your email campaign perhaps needs your solution in the next 90 days and might take action earlier if, if everything works out okay. And, and then you've got a final 20% of your email campaign that needs your, your solution right now. They actually need it today, but they need 10 or 15 days on your campaign in order to build enough trust to actually invest with you. And so it's critical that we understand that when, when we launch this, let's say, 15-day campaign, only a percentage of even the 20% that need your solution right now are going to surface. But we have to understand that there's another 60% of the list plus a portion of the 20% that needs it right now, but for some reason the trust and relationship isn't there yet, that will respond in 90 days, six months, a year, or two years from now. We cannot write off the rest of our list just because these individuals don't surface 
right now. We also have to have a balance between being so aggressive that we lose everybody on our list and make a few sales. Obviously, we have to balance that with giving people an opportunity to step up and raise their hand at, say, the 15- to 20-day mark so that those people who are ready are able to take action. So let's say that we look at this 15-day campaign and we say, what do we need to do? Well, let's just say that we're going to use Russell Granger's model, the seven triggers to yes, the new science behind influencing people's decisions. Let's say that we're going to use his list of triggers as all of the things that we want to accomplish in 15 days. We want to use the friendship trigger. We want to use the authority trigger. We want to use the consistency trigger. We want to use the reciprocity trigger. We want to use the reason why trigger. We want to use the hope trigger. Now, we don't want to use them all at one time. So we want to be very careful that we use a couple of them on our squeeze page. We use one or two of them in the first email. We use one or two in the next email. We use one or two in the next email. Okay, you know, we can reuse some of these, but we want to mix and match them. We want it to, be to, we want it to feel totally natural. And one of the things that I recommend to help when you're reading these emails to see that they feel completely natural is instead of writing them in a vacuum, one email at a time, instead write them together. Write them on one single word processing document or write them as a storyboard where you've got email one sitting here, you've got the next email sitting next to it, the next email sitting next to it, the next email sitting next to it, and so that you're able to look at it. And that email campaign, if you were to read all 10 or 15 emails from beginning to end, the emails themselves should flow like a story from the first email to the last email. Now, if you write each email in a vacuum, each email is going to stand alone. Now, by chance, this email may relate to this email, this email may relate to this email. We want all of the emails to, to happen as a story. So if we could imagine that we're going to see a movie, we go to the movies, we see a two-hour movie, and we see the entire two-hour movie, and we see it all at once. Okay, now, instead of seeing it as a movie, we could have seen it as a mini-series on television. We would have watched 20 minutes per night for six weeks. We would watch... And I believe that's about the number. If we have a 30-minute segment with commercials, I think we've got about, what, 18 or 20 minutes of content. So if we had a two-hour movie, we'd have six 20-minute segments. And we would watch 20 minutes on Monday night at 7 o'clock. And then at the end, we would know that if we wanted more, we would come back next Monday. But we would know that m next Monday, that what we received next Monday would be directly related and follow what we received last Monday. And so our minds are wired to be able to keep track of where we're moving. And so what happens is in our offline world, our minds are, our minds are uh, wired to be able to do that. And not just with television. Before the age of television, you know, people might tell stories. And maybe on Friday night they would gather around a campfire and they would tell stories. And maybe on the first Friday night, they would tell stories about their history a thousand years ago. And then the next Friday night, they would tell stories about their history 950 years ago. And then the next Friday night, they'd tell the story of their history 900 years ago. And then over the course of whatever it would take to cover the full thousand years, maybe the six months or a year, they would have their entire history. And then maybe they would start over at the beginning. But our human minds are wired to be able to keep track of the story. Okay, now, how do we remember a story best if we were to receive it historically, chronologically? So if we look at uh, even a uh, history of a particular country right now today, you know, what is one very strong way to study it? Well, from the beginning to the end. So this is what happened first. This is when the first war happened. This is when uh, the people agreed on this particular constitution. This is when people agreed on this amendment. And we have a history. The same thing if we, were, if we were to relate a story about something that might happen. Okay? So maybe we relate a story about somebody's education. They started out here, and then they went here, and they learned this, and they moved on. Even if we received that piecemeal over time, we would be able to keep that entire story straight. Now, if we were given this material haphazardly, the way many of us, 
perhaps write emails one at a time. We might receive a part of the history today, some other part the next time we meet. And then the third time we meet, when we hear this next history, we have to ask ourselves, does this happen before the first piece we learned? Is it after? Where does it all fit in? And if we were to receive all of that information in a haphazard fashion at the end of the year, we wouldn't understand the history as well as if we had received it in a chronological fashion. Now, assuming that we buy into what I've just given you, and I do 100%, and, and I, I believe that that's where human minds are wired, if we do that with our emails, once people realize can happen subliminally and subconsciously, once people realize that your emails are telling a story, meaning that each email builds on the last one, I believe two things will happen. I believe that secondarily, people will be looking for what the next email is going to be. However, I believe that first, primarily, that people subconsciously, maybe even subliminally, are going to be able to build a complete picture of whatever it is that you're attempting to teach them, persuade them, educate them on, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that the only way that we can effectively do that is to write our emails in such a way that we're looking at them in such a way that we can say this one flows to this one, flows to this one, flows to this one. Okay, so if we're doing our 15-day 15, uh, 15 campaign, let's say we want to send an email every other day. Okay, some people mail emails every day. Some people believe every three to four days is fine. I believe that no matter what the timing is, in the first 10 to 15 days, you need to touch them a few more times than you might throughout the rest of the campaign because we need to build trust quickly while people remember who we are, uh, especially if, if we, because we also have to cater not just to the person that's going to make a decision in 15 days, but to the person that's going to hang around for a full year. We need to build that trust quickly. At, we need to build that trust up front as quickly as we can possibly safely do it. However, we want to leave room to be able to continue to build that trust over time. We have a 15-day campaign. Let's say we do every other day, so we'd have a total of, say, eight emails. And we can include our squeeze page as a piece of this campaign. So we have, we have nine emails. So the first on the squeeze page, we might say, hey, we're going to focus on the authority trigger and we're going to focus on the reciprocity trigger. Okay, so we're going to show people that we have this, this knowledge and we're trusted in the marketplace, and we're going to give them something. That's our reciprocity. Okay, then perhaps the next email that we receive from them um, uh, builds on commitment and consistency. We told them we were going to send them a link, and we did. We didn't send them something they didn't ask for, or we didn't send them something that was unrelated to what they'd asked for. Okay? We are building, already building the idea that they can trust us to do what, they, what we say that we're going to do. Okay? Perhaps the third email that, we receive, that they receive from us builds hope. And in this email, we allow them to visualize what their might, life might be like with a particular solution. Okay? And maybe on this email, we throw in uh, uh, the authority trigger again. Okay? So we're continuing to build some authority early on in the campaign. Okay. Perhaps the next email now, uh, let's say we throw reciprocity back in. Okay. So we send them something free, whether it's a free report, a free MP3, a free webinar, whatever the case is. Okay. So let's see, we've, let's see, what have we not hit on here? We haven't really hit on the friendship trigger. So let's, let's think about an email campaign. You know, how could we appear to be more friendly? Um, well, we, what we could do is we could send out an email that says, look, you, I see you've been on my email list for three or four days. I really hope that what I've been sharing with you has been valuable information. And by the way, you know, I do answer my emails personally. I don't, I don't outsource that. It doesn't go to a help desk. So if you have any questions at all about anything, just shoot me an email. And, hey, as soon as I'm online, if I'm, you know, not the weekend or vacation or something, I'll, I'll hit you back and, and uh, hopefully I can answer your question. Okay, so perhaps we build into that friendship trigger right there. Perhaps another way to build into that friendship trigger is creating a, a video or an MP3 that's three to five minutes long that says, hey, you know, I know that you, you joined my particular business uh, uh, list. You've received a few emails from me, and I just wanted to introduce myself from a personal perspective. And, uh, hey, you know, this is a little bit about me. Here's a picture of me. This is what I like to do. These are my hobbies. This is what I do when I'm not working. 
you know, this is, you know, this is my wife or my husband, and this is my dog and my kids, and these are the things I like to do. These are some of my beliefs, and uh, hey, I hope I can get to know you better. So that may be one way that we can we can trigger this friendship trigger. Okay, so now we've got I, it, so far we've covered all of these, and so what, what we're going to do is we're going to con- continually go every single email that we're continuing to ask, and we're going to ask ourselves, can we? How can we use? one or two of these triggers. And we could also go back to Cialdini's list and ask ourselves, okay, is there something on this list that is perhaps not on Granger's list? For example, there's social proof. Okay, how can we throw in some social proof? Okay, is it possible to throw in liking? Of course, I think we look at the definition of liking. It's very similar to friendship trigger. Oh, maybe scarcity. So maybe there's, maybe there's a place to throw in scarcity. Maybe not. I don't believe that you need to use all of these. I believe that we need to use some combination. Hey, let's take this to the next level. Let's imagine we've written our 15-day campaign, and, I mean, that's the first place to start, right, the first 15 days. Okay? Now we say, I'd like to expand this to a 100-day or, or a year campaign. I want to expand this to 100, let's call it 100 emails because that number keeps coming to my mind. Let's call it 100 emails over the course of a year. So 365 days, 100 emails, they're going to get, what, an email every 3.6 days, a couple emails a week. I don't believe that's too much. Some people might. If you do, hey, cut it back to what you feel comfortable with, once every five days, once every seven days, what is every 10 days. I do believe, though, that in any market, if you mail less than once every 10 days, you, you, you really begin to lose touch with people. And I believe that if you are going to use a 7 to 10 day model where long term you're only touching people once every 7 to 10 days or even maybe once every 15 days, that the first week or two, they really need to see, hear from you three, four, five times and really solidify who you are so that down the road, you know, if they miss a couple emails and it's been 45 days since they've heard from you, they still know who you are. You really want to solidify that. I believe that. Let's call it a 100-day campaign. So now we look at this 100-day campaign and we say, well, what, what can we do in this 100-day campaign? Uh, I tell you what, before we dig into this 100-day campaign, I, I skipped one element I wanted to cover, and that's, you know, let's say we've got this 15-day campaign. We, we do not want to lose everybody on our list by being overly aggressive on our, after the 15th day, but we want to give those people who are going to raise their hand and do need our help right now the opportunity to raise their hand. And, and so let's just say that the way that we can help people is through a coaching program. We could do it through information products. We could do it through one-on-one consultation. We could, there's probably there are a number of different ways you can do it. Let's just assume so we have something to sink our teeth into. It's a coaching program. We, we're going to offer a coaching program after 15 days. Hey, now, possibly instead of offering the coaching program to everybody on the list, because not everybody's ready for it, we could use a filtering process, a filtering process that said, hey, you know, you, 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 you've been on the list now for two weeks, and I'm giving you that language. You, again, you don't, you don't need to state that. If, if you don't want to, you can. You don't have to. You know, but the idea here is that um, possibly at this point you have some additional questions about how maybe I can help you, and maybe you don't. You know, maybe you're at the point where, where you, you really don't need help with this for another 6 to 10 months or 6 to 12 months. And, hey, if that's the case, you know, I encourage you not to take action here. I encourage you to continue to receive my emails. You know, send me an email. If, if you've got any questions that I haven't answered for you, I'll do everything I can to help you. But if, if you're one of those people who you've got a, a need and you need to have it answered right now, I'd like to give you a way to answer. And then you could answer it in a number of different ways. You could say, you know, here's an opportunity to have a one-on-one consultation with me. Here's an opportunity to have a one-on-one consultation with my assistant. Here's an opportunity um, I'm going to do, you know, a webinar or a teleseminar that's going to tell you a little bit more about your need or your solution or what might be a good solution. Um, or maybe you have a sales letter. But you've been very clear in writing this that, hey, if you don't need this, please don't even go there. Okay, and that way, even if they do go there, they know that they really shouldn't be reading it and they don't hold it against you. Okay? So the idea is here that we're creating a filtering process so that those individuals who need us most can raise their hand, take action, get involved in coaching. But the people who need more than 15 days to bond with you, hey, they can take another 15 days. They can take another 30 days. They can take 60 days. They can take 90 days. They can take a year. It doesn't matter. Okay, so that's our 15-day period. Now, when we build our 100-day period or our 100-email period that goes over a 365-day period, 
we're going to ask ourselves, okay, obviously, number one is we're going to use all these triggers. But since we're doing a bigger campaign, remember our small campaign, our 15-day campaign, culminated in an opportunity to take action for those people who wanted to take action right now. Okay, so now what we're going to say is over the course of a year, how many opportunities do we want to give people to take action? Do we want to give them an opportunity every month? That's probably a good, you know, good timing to, to give people an opportunity. Maybe twice a month if we're very, very selective in filtering, we give people an opportunity to surface. So in, in this case, we might look at our timeline and we might say, okay, 15 days we're making an offer. And then maybe we say, okay, we've still got a highly responsive part of our list. 15 days later, we make a similar offer that has a filter on it. So we're not offering it to everybody. We're offering the opportunity to get offered. We're giving them the opportunity to get a one-on-one -on -one call. We're giving them the opportunity to get on a teleseminar, on a webinar. We're giving them the opportunity to read a sales letter. And one way to keep them from reading the sales letter could be to have an application that says, that says, hey, I've, you know, I've got a program. I'm limiting it to a number of people. If, if you don't meet all of these certain qualifications, you don't need it yet. I'm going to keep giving you free information because that's what you need right now. But, hey, if you're the kind of person that really, really wants more from me right now and you don't want to wait to get it for free for the next 90 days, fill out this application and you'll get more. And that's another filtering process. Only a small percentage of people will fill out that next application. You get a number of different filters that you could put on at 15 days. 30 days, you can use another filter. And then an additional 30 days, you can have another filter. So you may stage a total of 12 filtered opportunities to be able to take action over the course of 12 months. And so you'd, maybe you draw out a timeline, maybe you go buy a big poster board, or if you've got a whiteboard, you draw it out, month one, month two, month three. We're going to have these different offers that are going to happen. Then what you're going to do is you're going to fill in, just like we just filled in the first 15 days that led someone from not knowing you to making that first 15th day opportunity to filter. Then we're going to say, okay, we're going to make another offer in 30 days. What do we need to do? to get people ready for that next offer. Now, there's two things that I see that you can do to get people ready for the next offer. Okay, number one, which is what we've been discussing, is you're going to send out a few emails that continue to use these triggers. You're going to continue to use these triggers and these tactics to create relationship and trust. But what you're also going to do is you're going to say, okay, on the 30th day, I'm going to make an offer for a particular filter that's a little bit different from the filter I did the first time, are, is there or are there a couple of emails that I could possibly put in this sequence that kind of prepares people for that particular filter? So, for example, let's say that that filter is going to move people to a very specific niched coaching program that's a sub-niche of what you do. So it's going to be very tightly targeted. What you could do in one or two emails during that next 15-day period of time is send out free content, whether it's a 15-minute MP3 or 30-minute MP3 or an article that you've written or an email that you've written that simply educates the client on why they might need this particular thing in their life or their business with no attempt to sell them anything. You're not selling them anything. You're simply educating them. And then maybe one of the emails could be a question-based email that asks some questions. Have you ever thought about doing that in your business or life? You might be able to use the hope trigger that says, if you were to do that in your business or life, how would that make you feel? What, can you imagine what your life might be like with this? And then maybe you'd reach to use the reason why trigger. Hey, the reason why I'm asking this is because what I have found in working with some of my clients is that having that particular skill is a helpful thing. And if you'd like to know more about this, then click here, and then maybe they go to a full-length article when they click there that gives them even more solid information. It's not selling them. It's not asking them for more information. It's just giving them more solid information. Well, now, during, you're doing this during a 15-day period of time along with some emails that fulfill the other triggers, friendship, authority, consistency, reciprocity, you know, some of, the, some of uh, Cialdini's additional uh, uh, tactics. Then it, the time comes for this 15-day offer. Some of the people that have gone through this, this last portion of the campaign that have read some of that content, that have been genuinely thinking, hey, maybe this would work for me, then when they see your filter, 
they either fill out the application or they get on the phone with you or they get on the webinar or the teleseminar or however it is that you're planning to market to them. And now what you've done is you've allowed yourself to to segment a new portion of your list that didn't respond the first time that may respond this time. Okay, now obviously you can do the exact same thing for each of the following 30 day periods. You're going to determine, you know, hey, what are we going to offer at the end of 30 days? If we're going to offer that at the end of 30 days, what kind of ideas do we need to set up in people's minds so that they'll be more receptive to that filter? What do we need to do so we can build more relationship and trust? What do we need to do to, to use these triggers and these tactics in order to create this? And then what we're going to do is we're going to step back and we're going to say, okay, this is what our entire year is going to look like. Then we're going to sit back and we're going to write these emails 15 days or 30 days at a time. We're going to make sure that they flow from beginning to end and we're going to plug them in. Okay, now one, I believe this will be a final thought here before I open up uh, it for questions here. One final thought here is that I've given you this idea that one email should flow to the next, should flow to the next, should flow to the next. So if you can imagine your first 15 days as a 15-day or a 15-week mini-series on television that's 20 minutes a week for the 15 weeks or the 15 days. That's what that first 15 days is going to look like. Now, when you go to the next 15 days, you can change the channel if you want. Now, it can't radically change. I mean, it's still got to be in the same zone. It's still got to be on the same topic because that's what they've come to you for. But what you could do is you could change the focus just a little bit. And then all you need to do to make that happen so that people aren't, you know, just thrown off is on the 16th day, you send an email out that says, hey, over the last 15 days, I've taught you this, 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 and this, and I hope it's been truly valuable for you. However, one of the things that I've found that people really need to know in, with, you know, that has in your nature that has your challenges, one of the things that I've found that people really need to know is, and then introduce your next topic. And then you just say, hey, over the next 10 to 15 days, I'm going to put a little bit more effort into educating you on this, and I hope this is valuable to you. If you have any questions, send me an email. And now, now you've kind of moved into this next channel. You're teaching them on something a little bit different. You're moving them towards this next filter that is going to allow them to take action. And then the same thing, when you go to the next 30-day, maybe you change the channel just a little bit. You do the same thing on the first day of that campaign. You say, hey, over the course of the last 30 days, or you could just reference Class 15, you could reference the whole thing. It's up to you. You can say, hey, tie it to what you've just done. You say, hey, over the last 15 days, I've taught you this, this, and this. Hopefully, it's been helpful for you. If you have any more questions about it, send me an email. However, one of the things that I really believe that you need to learn is, and over the next 30 days, I'm planning to do everything I can to teach you that. And if you have any questions about that, send me and email. Folks, I'd like to open up the call for any questions about anything that I've covered so far. Okay, folks, if there aren't any questions, I'll go ahead and, uh, and wrap up this teaching and just leave you with a, a couple of final thoughts. I, I don't necessarily want this to so much be a review as, a, as literally a couple of, of final thoughts. I believe that if you use what I have taught you today in conjunction with where I have shown you to go to get deeper information, if you will use this and you will implement this into the planning of your email campaigns, not only will you find that your individual emails become more powerful, and not only do your individual email sequences generate more sales at the end of 15 days, at the end of 30 days, at the end of additional 30 days, at the end of a year, not only do I believe that you'll build more sales, I also believe that because you're building deeper and deeper relationships, that those people who do make a sale, okay, they choose to invest with you. They choose to put their money into the relationship and not just their time. That those individuals, because of the deeper relationship and trust and because of the fact that you will continue to build on your relationship and trust with those now paying uh, 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 prospects. They're, they're, not, they're not just free prospects now. They have made an investment in you that those individuals, because they trust you, they will entrust you with a longer period of time of working with you. They will trust you at a higher price than your competitors are able to charge because of the trust, because of the respect that they have for you, and you will have a greater probability 
of turning those buyers, those coaching clients, you know, whatever they are, whether they're buyers of information products, whether they're coaching clients, whether they're close coaching clients, whether they are group coaching program clients, whatever those clients are, that they will continue to invest with you because of the relationship and trust that they have in you, because of the emotional bonding that they begin to feel with you, then would individuals who have gone through a campaign that is that is more sporadic than what I've give, just given you. And by literally creating a campaign that uses Cialdini's tactics, that uses Granger's triggers, and uh, more particularly the understanding of how to use those particular triggers, structure them in email campaigns that build the relationship and trust using these tactics and triggers and structure it in such a way that you are able to allow people to self-select and filter themselves into uh, 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 programs or exploration or discovery of programs that you offer based on the relation, the depth of the relationship and trust which, with which they have with you and the need that has developed for whatever it is that you are offering and teaching.